associate pastor here at Oak Creek, and uh, just glad to be here, glad to, to see you today. And uh, I'll just give you fair warning, today's topic is kind of sad and kind of tough to deal with, all right? So hang on. Um, I, I, it's, it's just one of those, those things that we just have to talk about several times whenever we're talking about what it means to be a Christian in this broken world. Uh, we have to remember that our world is broken and that uh, we have to deal with, with sadness and suffering. Uh, the thing is, and you may know this in your own life, but sometimes bad things happen. And, you know, you ever have those moments and you're just like, man, this is not fair, this is not right, uh, this circumstance is beyond me. Uh, you, and sometimes you even get to where you're saying, like it says on the screen, when, when it, it just feels like it's just too much. We may not know why or how or what's going on. Uh, we may not know what has caused whatever it is that we're dealing with, whatever that circumstance might be, but we just know that it's just not quite right. It's not what we were hoping for in this life. So today we're going to look at a circumstance gone bad. And I, let me just tell you, it is an overwhelming circumstance just to even read. And so just bear with me even as I'm reading it. But we're talking about Job again today. Uh, we uh, started last week, we were talking about who he was. And he was a wealthy, rich, just a, a, a blessed man. He had all these, this stuff, all this family. Uh, and he was also a righteous man, which means he followed God. He did everything that God expected of him. He worshiped God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he did everything right and, and led his family well. And he now becomes the centerpiece for this, this conflict to prove that God is as glorious as he should be. And Satan comes in and says, hey, I'm going to test Job. Because I think if you, if you mean to Job, that Job won't worship God. And God says, yeah, let's see what happens here. And so here we go. Satan is about to attack Job, and Job is none the wiser to what's about to happen. So Job chapter 1 is where we're at today. Uh, we'll pick up in verse 13. And see if you can hang with this, all right? Now, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, The Chaldeans formed three groups and made a raid on the camels and took them and struck down the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And behold, a great wind came across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Just, just reading that leaves me breathless. I mean, just... Talk about the horrible, no good, very bad day. This is it. And this is, it's not funny. <laughs> this is not a funny, bad day. This is a horrible day. Job's troubles are described as coming from all different directions. The Sabaeans coming up from the south, fire coming from heaven, the Chaldeans coming in from the north, and the winds blowing from the east. He is surrounded by trouble, literally. Bad stuff coming from everywhere. You ever felt like that? Just overwhelmed? Can, don't know where, which way to turn because everywhere I look, it looks like it's going wrong. He, he, just coming, and, and these things come in rapid succession as well. One after another, after another, after another. I mean, you get the picture. The, the servant runs in and says, hey, I got bad news. And before he can finish telling the bad news, another guy's running up. You know, after the second guy, I'd be like, dude, don't let anybody else in my, door, my house, you know, <laughs> shut the door. This is like, no, no, one after another, after another. I mean, he's, he just, in, in chapter nine, Job said it felt like he just couldn't even catch his breath. And some people might say that this is unjust, that it's just not fair. Well, yeah, it's not fair. 
But all of this is falling within what God had allowed Satan to do. This is still within God's plan to bring himself glory. But can you imagine the wreck Job must have been at this point? I mean, I can't, I, I can't fathom what it's like to lose everything in about, what did it take me? About 30 seconds to read, right? I can't imagine what that's like. Can't I, I, I just, the, the feeling, the overwhelming thing, there's only a couple of times in my life where I've been given news where I've just had to just sit down, you know? And maybe that's happened more for you, I don't know. But there was a time in my life where that kind of thing happened, where just something came up that was just beyond anything that I could imagine. And it was really hard to deal with. We, uh, Christine and I had been married for two or three years, and uh, we were pregnant with our first child. And we were so excited. This is so awesome. Hey, babies, you know, and we're telling everybody, and everybody's excited for us, and just, you know, cheering and doing and, and, and going and, you know, all these celebrations and stuff. And it was right around Christmas time, so it was all fun and, you know, a lot of people just excited for everything going on. And we went to the doctor and uh, doctors, uh, in, in the course of one sentence, I remember this very clearly, he said, so the baby doesn't look like it's developing, so we have to figure out how to remove the tissue. And he moved from baby to tissue in one sentence. And I was like, there's something wrong here. And he said, yeah, this baby has been miscarried, so we're going to have to deal with this. And here's all the things, the steps that we have to take. And I remember looking at it. I'm like, do what? What, is the, what, is, what are you saying? I mean, I didn't even know this kind of thing happened. All right? I'm, little, I'm young. I don't know. It's a foolish kid kind of thing. Like, what are you talking about? I don't understand. What, do you, what does this mean? And he's like, which part do you not understand? We're going to do this? I'm like, dude, I don't need clinical right now. <laughs> Let's start over. Let's come back to this. And I just remember just, just overwhelmed, that crushed moment. Like, I, I can't believe what. I, huh? <laughs> and I remember thinking, man, this, this isn't fair. We already told everybody we were having a baby, so now what are we going to do? And, and I remember thinking, man, I, I, I can't handle this. I don't, know what, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do here. And I remember crying out to God saying, and you know, I, I didn't sign up for this. We got home later that evening, and I'm just like, what is this? What is happening here? I even re distinctly remember saying, God, I don't think you're very good right now. <laughs> you're not a good God. I can't carry this kind of thing on my own. Heck, I can't even carry it with just my wife. You know, we, we can't do this. Maybe you've mistaken me for someone else. Let's start this over. If I go to sleep and I wake up the next morning, this was just one of those bad days. That's not real. Why me? And there was a period of, of deep sadness as I began to realize that this was real that we were going to have to deal with this. And then I had to relive it every single moment someone called and said, hey, so how's things going, you know? Like, ugh, here we go again. And remember, I, I called my buddy when we first found out, uh, he had been going to our church, he's a friend of mine, and uh, was trying to explain to him what was going on, and I still was trying to figure out what was happening, and uh, I knew that I wasn't making a whole lot of sense, and I felt really bad for him. And finally he was like, all right, Kel, just, Baby, go or no go? And I'm like, no go. <sighs> and just more waves of overwhelming feelings and emotions. And man, this is just terrible. And we got home from the hospital, and uh, a friend of Christina's called, and I answered the phone. And first thing, how's your big fat pregnant wife? <laughs> I'm like, she's not so pregnant anymore. Like, what? You know, just trying to deal with all of that. They weren't trying to be rude, but every time you have to start over and re revisit that feeling and all of that kind of stuff. And it was just an overwhelming time for us. Now, thankfully, we had community with us, people around us to help us through that process. And, and that is part of the blessing of, of being a part of church. But in the moment, we were overwhelmed. It was, it was too much. Three months later, we're like, man, we're going to figure this out. Three months later, we're going to, we found this dog, this stray. We decided to take it in. We adopted this dog, Buddy, that died three days after we adopted it. 
what a great, at that point, that's when I broke down. That's when I just, I couldn't take it anymore. The vet called, said your dog died. And I, I literally sank into the chair like I couldn't stand up. <laughs> like, what the heck is going on here? God, what are you doing in the midst of all of this? I was still processing all that grief. Uh, you, you may have heard the, the, the stages of grief. When you're not grieving, it's easier to hear them. So I'm hoping that you're not grieving today. Here they are, just a reminder of what goes on. Whenever you're dealing with loss of any kind, even if death, whether it's a broken relationship, uh, whether you, you stuff got stolen or whatever, you know, when you're dealing with these kinds of things, these are the stages of grief. It's not a linear process, which means that you don't go from one to the next necessarily. Uh, you could be in one stage for a long time and then another stage for just a couple of minutes. And you never know. And another thing you need to know is that you go back and forth, all right? Sometimes you may think, you've all, oh, I'm good with all of this. And then you realize, no, maybe not, you know? And you're back and angry and whatever. But here's the steps. So first off is denial. No, this didn't happen. This isn't real. I don't know what you're talking about. You know, I, I don't get this. Then you get angry, ah, oh, man, I, this is not fair, how could this happen, this, you know, I hate this, I hate this situation, these people involved, you get all that emotions going through there. Then you begin bargaining, well, maybe, uh, maybe if I go to sleep and I wake up the next morning, it's not really going to happen, all right, you know, or maybe, God, you kind of undo this and we'll, uh, you know, I'll go to church forever. We, we make those deals on, you know, whatever, I'm working through those things. Then inevitably, there's some form of depression. Sometimes it's worse than others. Sometimes it's just intense sadness. Sometimes it's clinical. You know, we have to work through that as well. And then ultimately, the goal is to move to acceptance and, and moving towards those things. So those are the, the ways that people, everybody deals with grief in these basic ways, all right? And so you may have experienced that before. You may not. You, know, you may be getting there. Just a heads up, if grief is coming, it will happen. Know that these kinds of things are going to be have to, you're going to have to deal with these things eventually. It's not a straight path. It's processed. You have to find yourself within those things, figuring out where you are, and know that you're going to bounce back and forth. And while you're grieving, in the process, your well-intentioned friends are going to say stupid things to you. And most of us have been the well-intentioned friends at one time or another, and we've said something dumb. So here's some things I want to remind us to not say, okay? Is that Okay because this is easy, all right? This is lighter, right? Here's one of the things that you can say, or not say. Let me know if there's anything I can do. Here's why that's bad. When someone is grieving, they don't know what they need, much less what you could do for them. That make sense? They can't think through all that kind of thing. In the process, in the midst of the crisis, they're in crisis mode, so they can't think through the, the things they need. And so, Instead of saying this to someone who's grieving, say something like, hey, I'm going to the grocery store right now. Can I get you milk, eggs, and anything else on your grocery list? And I will bring it to your house. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, sure, right? Inevitably, that's going to happen. Or, hey, I'm going to come over on Tuesday and I'm going to clean your bathrooms for you. Okay? Uh, okay, right? Those are things that we know that we would need, so turn it over and just offer specific help right up front, know exactly what's going on, and so that you can say, this is exactly how I'm going to help you, all right? Or let me know what you need. Let me know what you need doesn't mean anything. Here's how I can help you. Another thing say that I don't want you to say to someone who's grieving is, I know how you feel, because you don't. You don't. You may have experienced something similar. You may have some grief that might be along the same lines, but no two griefs are the same, ever. And so you can't say, I know how you feel. That's just not true. And the person hearing that will say, no, you don't, <laughs> anyway. And so instead, here's what you can say instead. Say, I'm sorry for your loss. And just leave it at that. I'm sorry for your loss. That shows sympathy. That shows respect. It shows that you are connecting with them, that you understand that there's something going on, and it doesn't step on those fragile emotions. I get this. I'm sorry for your loss. And then the, the last one, don't say this either, is God will use this for his good. That's dumb. Like, that just drives me crazy. That, that implies that God wants pain and suffering to happen to you. And that's... 
I know it's well-intentioned, but don't say those kinds of things. It, we, God didn't design this world to work this way. He does, he, we have to use grief and we experience loss because of what has happened in this world, because of sin. And the only reason that we're dealing with any kind of brokenness anyway, with death or discord or, or any kind of disease, all that kind of stuff, it's because of the fall, because of what happened when Adam sinned. That's what's going on. We need to, the people around us to come to us and remind us that despite our fallen world, God is in control. But he's in control, not in some general, big, broad sense of in control. Not he's sitting up in the sky holding everything together like that. We need to remember in the midst of our grief that God is in control right alongside us. Right with us. Grieving with us. Present with us. It says that God mourns with those who mourn. Death is the enemy here. Death has always been the enemy. For me, when, when we deal with grief, and when I've dealt with grief, the most in, helpful verse that I've read and, and find and come back to is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And it says, O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of sin, death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You hear that? This is the hope that death has no victory. Even the sting of death is nothing compared to the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the hope that we can begin to cling to. I, I, read, I was asked to read this verse at my grandmother's funeral and she loved Jesus and had you know, been suffering from Alzheimer's and kind of been gone for a long time. But we finally get to the funeral, and, and I tried to read this verse at her funeral. And that was the moment when I realized that this is our hope. Because of who Jesus is, because my grandmother trusted Jesus with her life, death was not the final answer for her. Death is not the final answer for any who, come, who call on the name of Jesus as Lord. There's, n there's nothing to worry about there. And while we still grieve, we have hope. We grieve as those who have hope instead. And that is great news. Death is a reality that we all must face, but it is not the final answer. It's not the final answer for those who trust in Jesus. By grace, we are saved through faith. We trust Jesus, and he gives us hope, a new life, a way to look at the world that is, that, that is hopeful, that through a lens that allows us to see what the world is supposed to be like and not dwell on how the world actually is. So we have to admit who we are, believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and just confess that he is Lord and that hope is promised to us. And it's only through the grace of God that we can move through our suffering. When I was facing death and, and looking at all the, the, the stuff that I was dealing with back, uh, you know, over 12, more than 12 years ago, I kept coming back to a song and this song came up in the church that we were at over and over and over again. And it really came to mean something to me. And I'm, I don't sing, so instead I'm just going to read you the lyrics. Is that okay? Some of you are thankful for that. So. But here's the, the song. The lyrics to this song just kept coming back to me in the midst of grief. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. You give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. 
And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. And in the midst of my pain, in the midst of my grief, with tears coming down my face, just knowing that I had nothing else to offer, I remember coming to that point where I had to say, blessed be the name of the Lord no matter what. And I continue to proclaim that the name of the Lord is blessed, that God is good, and that God is powerful. I think this is where all of us can be. And I think that because I look at what Job did and it kind of seems consistent with the experience of those who trust in God. Here's what Job did. Verse 20, he said, uh, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head and fell on the ground and worshipped. So he shaved his head to show that he was sad. I shaved my head because I don't have hair. But he shaved his head to show that he was sad. He tore his clothes as a sign of grief. And what did he do? He worshipped. He worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. Distraught with grief at the calamities that have crushed his household, Job turns to God in worship. In worship. In the wake of his loss, he see, we see him embodying grief and trust. Because he knows who God is. His actions demonstrated that he, his grief was real, was overwhelming to him. And at the same time, he's totally resigned to the sovereign will of God. And in contrast to what Satan happens, who has the victory here? God does. Because what does Job say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Satan said, oh, he's going to say, curse God and die. And what does Job Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our crying out to God in grief, crying out to God in pain, same kind of thing. What is your situation? What is it that's making you say, God, this is too much? Here's one more story to help. sophomore in college. It was January of 2002. I um, started to get headaches and um, I'd always, you know, been healthy. I, I just didn't, I didn't know what a chronic illness was. I was really healthy and had tons of energy. I was working and I, this lady that I worked with one day, she's like, I went and asked her for some Tylenol and she said, Kelly, do you realize that you've asked me for Tylenol every day this week? And I was like, oh. She's like, you're having headaches every day? And I was like, ah, yeah, I have had a headache every day this week. And she's like, you may want to go to the doctor. And I was like, huh. It was just kind of that moment where I realized I am having headaches every day. And then from there, it just was like a crazy downward spiral of um, had headaches. Then the headaches didn't go away. They just stayed all day long and, and they changed in how bad they were. And then I started to have pain in my muscles, pain in my joints. Um, I started problems with my hormones. The symptoms weren't staying the same. It was spreading. Um, and my symptom list is, it's ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> there's probably literally like hundreds of things wrong, you know? And, I think that I think some of some of the way of coping with it is just that through the years it was kind of like I'm either going to be a miserable sick person who makes everybody around me feel 
miserable and feel sorry for me, feel bad for me, I'm in horrible pain. Or I can say, God, give me grace, give me strength, give me love for the people I'm around so I can think about them more than I'm thinking about, you know, the knife in my head. I mean, it's a horrible disease, like my body is is really falling apart in so many ways. It's not working the way that God originally made it to work. So how could I look at that and say there's anything good about the disease itself? Or I love my migraines. So that's, that's insanity. That isn't Christianity. I mean, uh, but to despise, but, but to despise the very things that are bringing you closer to your Savior is also really insane. <laughs> I just, I can't despise that. You know, I can truly say that with my body, I don't have fears about what's going to happen to my body. And it's just like, I know that the Lord's got me. You know, if I never walk again normally, it just, those things seem so, they really seem so small to me because I'm in the middle of a, a true miracle, you know, of having joy. And I even like my life. Like, I don't even just have joy. Like, I'm actually kind of happy. <laughs> and that's a gift, too, you know? I mean, I have, I have hard days and times where I've, you know, fallen down in the middle of the house and cried on the floor. I mean, this, it's, it's not like that doesn't touch me. I'm not talking about some weird, you know, being transferred out of your life. And, the life is still hard. It's very hard. You want to have hope um, that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, you know? But I can tell you that I have seen that, you know? And it may not be the way that I would prefer, you know? It would be nice to be well, and I may be well. Like, I'm not in no way do I think that this is like a permanent thing just because it's happening right now. And I, when I look at my life, I'm like, we're coming up on 14 years. 14 years is a good chunk of my life because I'm still fairly young, but that's, that's 14 years, you know? If it is preparing me and refining me and I don't know if I would say that I thought that before my illness, but I can definitely say that it has been good for me. It's been good for me. You know, it has hurt me physically. It has not hurt me spiritually. By the grace and by the power of God, we can face death. By the grace and power of God, we can face disease. By the grace and power of God, we can face discord. We can say what she said. God, give me grace, give me strength, give me love for the people I'm around. And when we look at the life that we've been given, we can begin to glorify God in the midst of our suffering. And we too can say, it's been good for me. It's been good for me. Then we can worship and proclaim to everyone, blessed be the name of the Lord. Let me pray for you.